Journeys of Hope. Life is a journey, and this is your spiritual passport. Where will the journey take us today? Let's walk together as we learn to become people of faith and hope. Welcome to Journeys of Hope. I'm Mary Jane Fox. I'm the co-director at Pilgrim Center of Hope, where we are recording at St. Joseph Studio. Pilgrim Center of Hope, producer of this weekly radio and podcast program, is a nonprofit ministry founded in 1993, and our mission is to guide people to Christ and the Church. Today, we will discover how God's plan is revealed to us through our daily faithfulness to His revelation. We will include a scripture, insights on the tenderness and compassion of Christ, and meet a role model, a saint, who because of an accident he experienced, caused him to discover gifts he had to offer God, which resulted in telling others about the mercy and compassion of God. Our journey today is the scriptural journey with on the compassion of Jesus. And today we will discover in depth the compassion of our Lord, but first we're going to look at the true meaning of the word compassion. Compassion refers to kindness and sympathy, but there's something deeper, something even more profoundly powerful in its meaning. It means to feel with others, to be one with them in their feelings, in their pain, their hurt, to enter into their circumstances. You know, there are numerous situations of Jesus' compassion recorded in the New Testament, but we're going to look at two specific scripture stories, both giving us a closer look at the compassion of Jesus, the Lord. The first one is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 34. It takes place along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. As he landed, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion. On them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. The second scripture we're going to take is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 44. But the story, it's about a story that takes place in the village named Bethany outside of Jerusalem. It's the story of Lazarus raised from the dead. Jesus wept because of the loss of his friend, but he raises him up from the dead. Now, these two scripture stories tell us of Je- that Jesus had compassion and that he was concerned for the other. Bishop Thomas John Gubbleton, in one of his homilies, stated that compassion was one of the most singular and important qualities, virtues of Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? One of Jesus's important virtue is that of compassion. But let's, let's learn about the compassion of our Lord Jesus as we look at the first scripture story from the Gospel of, 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 um, of Mark. Let's imagine ourselves along the shore of Galilee, a large lake in the northern part of ancient Palestine, which we, today we call the Holy Land. There are a couple of villages along the north shore of the Sea of Galilee where the Jewish people lived. Those two large villages, villages at that time were Capernaum and Magdala. However, between these two villages, the shore is quite open, and there would be fishermen along the shore with their boats. There are orchards of olive trees and grassy areas on the hill uh, that extends up from the shore. A main road from the northwest shore leads to the upper Galilee region, leading you to Nazareth. And this road was built by the Romans, and still today, you can see a part of this ancient road. And Jesus, as well as others, would have traveled this road from Nazareth through, um, you know, along the the desert to the Galilee region, and then finding themselves north of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus spent most of his three years of public ministry in the Galilee area, and and he would stay at the house of Peter, who was a fisherman, and became one of the apostles. Jesus would visit the towns of Capernaum and Magdala. Capernaum was a thriving city. It sat at the crossroads of much traveling trading route, the Way of the Sea, or Via Maris, which was a thoroughfare open to travelers. It was like an international highway stretching from Damascus and Syria in the north to Egypt in the south. It was the ideal hub from which to spread the gospel. 
the Via Maris ran the full length of ancient Palestine and also served as the first century line of communication. In one day, news could travel 20 miles along this route in both directions. In two days, crowds in multiple thousands could come to see the one they hoped would be the Messiah. The other largest city in the northern shore of Galilee was Magdala, which was known for its fishing industry. They would export salted fish to Rome from here. And today, you can see the ancient ruins of Magdala. They show us where they kept the large groups of fish and an ancient synagogue with much of its original mosaic floors. Now again, let's picture in our minds the northern shore of Galilee, parts of the shores rocky and yet smooth enough to walk along the shore to the water and dock your boat. The distance between these two large villages mentioned earlier, Capernaum and Magdala, it's about, oh, a bit over two miles. And in between, we find, as I said, those fishermen mending their nets, preparing for their fishing time, which was most done during the night into the early morning. Jesus and the disciples had taken the boat to a lonely place away from the crowds to rest a while. They were always pressed by crowds. They had no leisure even to eat, so they went away in the boat by themselves. Now place yourselves in the story. Jesus returns with the disciples by boat. The crowds see the boat coming to shore, and they are waiting for Jesus to arrive. As the scripture said, as he landed, He saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Jesus feels compassion on seeing their spiritual need. The root word of compassion comes from Latin. It's misericordia, the same word for mercy. He looked at the crowds who came to see him with compassion. They were tired and hungry, had traveled a long way just to see him. He welcomed them all and healed their sick. It did not matter to Jesus why the crowds were there. He simply loved them without regard to their background or status in life. Even their lack of understanding of who he was and why he was there. Their their understanding would soon come. He simply loved them right where they were. This happens today. Jesus loves us right where we are. That hasn't changed because God is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Well, they climbed the mountain to see him, and they must they must have been familiar with, um, well, by that time, they were famished by the time they finally reached him uh, on this uh, like large hill. And he sees the people as a flock without a shepherd. Well, we all know that a flock of sheep needs a shepherd to care for them, guide them, and feed them. And so our Lord Jesus begins to teach them. As he uh, is on this uh, semi-small mountain, actually it's a large hill, (laughs) along not too far from the shore of Galilee, and the people are gathered, and, and he feeds them. Because the scripture story continues with Jesus telling the disciples to give them something to eat. Now, the word throng used earlier signifies a multitude, a crowd, a mass of people. So two fish and five loaves of bread are presented to to the Lord by the disciples. And Jesus tells the disciples to get the crowd seated and organized. Now, this is certainly unexpected. What would you think if you were one of the disciples? How are you to feed this multitude with two fish and five loaves of bread? However, let's recall that these disciples are followers of Jesus, who is, um, and they believe is their master, and they have seen how he has reacted to the crowd. They have seen him healing others and have heard him teach. So they've witnessed the compassion of their master. So they witness Jesus taking the two fish and the bread as he looks up to heaven, blesses the items, and gives them to the disciples to feed the people. Everyone ate, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Mark makes note in his gospel that those who ate were 5,000 men. 
Now, in this miracle, Jesus shows his supernatural power and his love for men. Before Jesus performed this miracle, though, on such a grand scale, he did a very simple thing. He thanked his father first. Jesus recognized that all good things, all good gifts come from our Heavenly Father. The gesture of our Lord looking up to heaven. I mean, here's Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord, who would be the Savior of the world, is looking up to heaven as he blesses the fish and loaves. And this is recalled in the liturgy, the Mass. It is when the priest takes the host in his hands during Mass, lifts it up toward heaven and looks up, saying these words, On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his Almighty Father, given you thanks, he said the bless- blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Now, at this point in the Mass, we are preparing to be present at a miracle greater than that of the multiplication of the loaves, the changing of bread into his own body, offered as food for all mankind. He demonstrated his great love for us by feeding the multitudes while he was alive and then providing for all of us after he died and resurrected by breaking bread with his disciples and asking them to do this in memory of me. Now, what's so interesting is that this is a precursor to the Holy Eucharist and the Mass itself. You may be thinking, hmm, what's the connection? The connection of the fish and loaves and the Mass. Well, I will share with you from a book written by Bishop Arthur Saratelli of the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey. In his recent book titled, Scriptural Novena to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, Bishop Saratelli reveals a collection of insights about the Eucharist found in the scripture and about the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fish by viewing it in the way a movie director looks at a scene from multiple camera angles. But I've, I've taken a, a quote from the book that I'd like to share with you, which really hits the heart and, and what, we're, what we're talking about here on our journey. Quote, the fact that the Eucharist is at the heart of the church may very well be the reason why the evangelists give the miracle of the loaves and fish such a prominent place in their Gospels. It is the only miracle that Jesus performed that is recorded in all four Gospels. The Gospels differ on the number of fish that Jesus multiplied for the hungry crowd that day, either 4,000 or 5,000. Bishop Saratelli continues to write in his book, The four evangelists understood that when Jesus multiplied the loaves of bread in the bright sunshine of the Galilee, he meant that miracle to shed light on how we understand, how we celebrate, and live the Eucharist. Jesus finds his joy in leading us to the happiness of being one with God. The Son of Man came to seek out and to save what was lost. Jesus stays with us in the Eucharist. It is the sacrament of divine compassion. This is what Bishop Saratelli writes. It is the sacrament of divine compassion. Whether it is a physical, emotional, or spiritual need that brings us before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, He greets us with open arms and embraces us in love. The closer we come to the Lord, the greater our joy. But let's return to the crowd. We should be impressed with the docility of the massive crowd. I think I was when I read the story. I said, they are hungry. They've been out most of the day. How long, Heaven knows how long they've traveled without very little food. They are being told to be seated on the grass. And it's interesting that the gospel writers mention grass, which means the springtime. <laughs> and, you know, are they expecting, and the springtime is when Passover happens. And it was during the Passover when the Last Supper occurred. You know, the connections are just fantastic. But are they expecting to be fed without wondering how Jesus and his disciples will provide for the thousands present? However, they are docile. They're open to what will come because they believe they have placed their trust in this man, Jesus. We should also be impressed how the disciples respond to Jesus. They do what they are told. They, to organize the crowds to be seated on the green grass, wondering how are they going to feed this crowd with only two fish and five loaves of bread. And yet, they respond to Jesus. 
where are we responding to the story? Are we in one in the crowd wanting to see this man called Jesus, the, the master, waiting to see what he can do for us? Are we relating with the disciples, wondering how is it that this situation, which seems impossible, would be addressed? Perhaps we can relate to both. And that's what's so beautiful about the scriptures and bringing the scriptures into our daily life, Ponder, reading and pondering the scriptures. Well, Jesus took that small gift of five loaves of bread and two fish, and he multiplied it by 5,000. And Jesus can do the same with us and for us as well. We bring to Jesus the small, what we believe are our small gifts, our talents, our abilities that we have, and he makes our gifts grow if, if we cooperate with the graces he sends to us. When Jesus does this, though, the increase in our gifts are not meant just for our own benefit. Our gifts were given to us to be shared with others, to build up the body of Christ as we are members of that body. Remember the part of the scripture story, after they all ate and were satisfied, they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Well, the collecting of the leftovers is a way of showing us the value of little things done out of love for God. Nothing is wasted if done out of sincere love for God. Even the little things matter to God. And I think this is so powerful for us to remember and to think and to, to ponder and to think, I mean, to really, really take to heart. Because I have heard people tell me, oh, they don't bother God with the little things because they think that the small things don't matter to Him. On the contrary, this scripture tells us that the broken pieces we were gathered, the little things are important. What does this gospel passage teach us? That Jesus is concerned and feels compassion for the whole man, body, and soul. Jesus distributes the word to souls and cures and nourishes the body. Jesus did not click his fingers and make the loaves and fish appear. No, he looked up to heaven. He thanked his heavenly Father as he prayed, and the miracle of the multiplication occurred. The compassion of Jesus, the Master. As we discovered earlier, it did not matter to Jesus why the crowds were there. He simply loved them without regard to their situation in life. Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord and Master, loves us right where we are. But let's explore the second scripture story from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, lived in the village called Bethany, which is around two miles from Jerusalem. It's on the other side of the Mount of Olives. Today, there's a Catholic church built over the ruins of their home, and the nearby tomb is believed to be that of Lazarus, which is located near that church today. When Jesus would travel from Galilee to Jerusalem on pilgrimage for the Jewish feast days, he would sometimes stay at the home of his friends, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, to which he was very attached. I'm not going to read the entire scripture, those, the verses from 17 to 44. It's an amazing story, but now just a summary of that scripture story. You know, Jesus hears about his friend Lazarus. He lies ill in Bethany. His sisters, Martha and Mary, send word to Jesus to come quickly. His, you know, their brother is sick, but Jesus waits to go. He tells the disciples that are with him, this illness is not until death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. I mean of it. So Lazarus, though, he dies, and it's play, he's placed in the family tomb near the house. Martha and Mary, his sisters, along with friends, mourn his death. Well, Jesus arrives after Lazarus has been placed in the tomb four days. Martha sees Jesus coming and goes to him and tells him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. But what was Jesus' response? He said to Martha, your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Of course, Martha responded that she did believe. Then she leads Jesus to the tomb. Jesus wept. 
This is the shortest sentence. Jesus wept. He was deeply moved. Jesus said, take away the stone. And the stone here is a large rolling stone that covered the, the traditional tombs at that time. It would have taken several men to, to roll it, to move it. When Jesus lifted his eyes and said to Father, he said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Then he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Well, here he comes out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. This is one of Jesus' most outstanding miracles. Nothing is impossible with God. Even having their stone removed, moved by several men, where were, where were they thinking when Jesus said, take away the stone? The stone, as large as it was, as heavy as it was, it was not an obstacle to the compassion of Jesus. We may think that the heaviest cross we're carrying and then the largest, most terrible situation in our lives, Jesus cannot handle? Yes, there's no obstacle to his compassion. This reminds me of a passage in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, chapter chapter 36, verse 27. The Lord has given the prophet Ezekiel a message to give to the Israelites. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Since the beginning, God's message is to reach the heart of his people. Did you notice something Jesus did that was similar to the previous scripture story about the multiplication of the loaves and fish? I'm sure you did. Jesus lifted his eyes up to heaven and called upon his heavenly Father and thanked him. His words were, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. Jesus recognized that all good gifts come from our Heavenly Father. And this is a lesson for us to praise God and thank Him daily and throughout the day. And even when we're not feeling good or are sick, we need to thank God for the gift of life or what we have then, whether it be medicine, doctor, even insurance, or maybe if we don't have insurance to cover certain situations, to thank God that we live in a, in a uh, where perhaps others will help us in, in, the, in the right direction. It is an effort because it's something we usually may not do. We usually are saying, why me, God, or help me. But to thank God and praise God is very powerful. Thanking God is an act of faith and adoration because we are acknowledging Him as our Heavenly Father and entrusting all to Him who knows all, especially in situations we don't understand. We must believe that He wants to help us. He wants to heal according to His holy will, but He wants us to trust in Him. But let's take note of Martha's response to Jesus when she heard Him tell her, your brother will rise to life. Martha was filled with confidence after Jesus told her this. Well, our prayer can be like Martha, filled with confidence. And maybe we we need to pray for the grace to be filled with confidence, a prayer of abandonment into the hands of God, who knows better than we what we need. As she said, all she said was, I know that you can do it. If you will do it, it is for you to judge, not for me to presume. God may not always answer our prayers when we expect them or in the way we expect His answer may be much greater if we persevere in prayer and continue to put our trust in Him. As we just heard in the story, all prayers are answered in this way, either in the way we expect or perhaps later in time or maybe never because God knows better what is best what is us. But all prayers heard if indeed prayed from the heart. Martha and Mary had hoped that Jesus would heal Lazarus from his sickness. Instead, we just heard his miracle, which was much greater, because he raised Lazarus from the dead, showing us all he had power over death, which proves that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. St. John records Jesus' affection by describing his emotion and sorrow at the the death of his friend. Jesus wept. This gives us an opportunity to reflect on the depth and compassion of Jesus' feelings. If the physical death of his friend can move him to tears, what will he not feel over the spiritual death of a sinner? 
St. Augustine, who gave many sermons and wrote extensively on the life of Christ, commented about Jesus' uh, Jesus weeping. He said, Let man also weep for himself, for why did Christ weep but to teach men to weep? We also should weep for our sins, to help us return to the life of grace through conversion and repentance. To weep is not to be depressed. We're talking about a sorrow. Really, it's based on love. Jesus here loved Lazarus. He was a friend, so he wept upon knowing Lazarus had died. We should appreciate our Lord's tears. He is praying for each one of us, we who are sinners. Jesus identifies himself as the way, the truth, and the life in the Gospel of John. Without Jesus, we have lost our way. We do not know, we do not know the truth, and our life is empty. Christ's compassion toward all as a resplendent sign that God has visited his people and that the kingdom of God is at hand. He saw the vast crowds gathering at the Sea of Galilee to see him and listen to him. He was compassionate and saw them at a loss. We are called as his followers to see others with his eyes as well. Well, um, let's take a quick break, and when I come back, I'll continue uh, with this whole beautiful story, this journey, scripture journey, uh, with the compassion of Jesus. And I want to share a story that my husband, Deacon Tom, and I experienced in our ministry uh, relating to our journey today, uh, a journey, a scripture journey uh, on the compassion of Jesus. This is Journeys of Hope, and I'm Mary Jane Fox. I'm so glad you joined me on this journey. And it's always good. Isn't it always wonderful to hear and to learn about the compassion of our Lord, to know more about our Master, who is our Savior? I'll be right back. Stay with me. You're on the everyday journey of life, and sometimes it's tough to keep hope alive. Well, that's why Pilgrim Center of Hope is here for you. Not only does Pilgrim Center of Hope provide you programs like Journeys of Hope, but did you know you can also find other helpful media productions from Pilgrim Center of Hope on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Every first Friday, take an audio retreat with Jesus called Meet the Master. Every third Thursday, have a social with the saints. And our new series, Who is the Man of the Shroud, meets at the intersection of faith, true crime, science and medicine, history, art, and much more. Find it all at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or on your favorite podcast app. And keep hope alive in your daily journey. Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. This is Angela Cialana. And I'm Jason Nunez. We are two of the hosts of Journeys of Hope, the weekly radio broadcast and podcast program that brings you inspiring stories of faith, hope, and love from around the world. We have an important message today to share with you. As we approach the fifth year of this program, because of you, we have been able to reach tens of thousands of people through podcasts and over the airwaves. When we say that Pilgrim Center of Hope's programming is supported by God's grace and by you, we truly mean it. We're grateful for everyone who has supported us to make our mission possible since 1993. This effort of support and the need for support is ongoing. Presently, Pilgrim Center of Hope is seeking monthly supporters who want to help us continue our mission of guiding people to encounter Christ. You can also make a difference by sponsoring a week of Journeys of Hope for only $50. You can dedicate a week of the program to a special person or organization of your choice. This can be a spiritual gift in honor or in memory of someone who has touched your life. Your dedication will not only honor your loved one, but also join us in our mission of evangelization and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands of listeners. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter of Pilgrim Center of Hope or Dedicated Journeys of Hope program today. You can do so by visiting pilgrimcenterofhope.org and click How to Help. There you'll find a donation form. Or, if you'd like to dedicate a Journeys of Hope program, you can do so on our wish list. Feel free to call us at 210-521-3377 to discuss how you can partner with Pilgrim Center of Hope to continue guiding people to Christ. Thank you for your generosity, and as we say at Pilgrim Center of Hope, every little bit helps. May God bless you. 
Welcome back to Journeys of Hope. I'm Mary Jane Fox. Our journey today is the scriptural journey on the compassion of Jesus. Earlier on a journey, we looked at two scripture passages from Mark and John, specifically two stories that point to the compassion of our Lord. Oh, these two stories tell us so much, don't they? But specifically, we were looking at the compassion and, and mercy of Christ. As we heard earlier, that this is one of greatest one of Jesus' greatest virtue was that of compassion. Um, and we saw how the vast crowds gathered at the Sea of Galilee to see him and listen to him. We we heard about the compassion he had uh, upon them and saw them as as a at a lost. And we are called as his followers to see others with his eyes and to, you know, have compassion with others, is to, to, to feel with them, to listen to them, to be present to the other. Um, I began to learn to do that. I learned this really when my husband and I, my husband Deacon Tom and I, had a uh, were worked at St. Matthew Catholic Church several years ago, and. St. Matthew Catholic Church, what was our full-time job there? Well, it was going door to door in our parish boundaries. And I know it sounds quite different and unique, and you're thinking, what? Catholics going door to door? Well, yes, this one Catholic couple did that 40 hours a week, five days a week. And it started, um, it was really a beautiful ministry because we learned so much. And Imagine walking the streets and going house to house eight hours a day, five days a week. And what was the purpose? The purpose was to find those who had fallen away from the Catholic Church or did not have any religion and simply um, and to simply invite them back to God. Or if they had any questions about Catholicism, we would provide resources. For those we met that did have a religion, we would ask if they had questions, again, you know, about the Catholic Church. And, you know, we we came upon many situations, and you're probably wondering, did anybody slam the door in our face once they heard we were Catholic? Well, in those days, no, no really. In the eight year, uh, seven years that we did this full time, I would probably count in two hands the number of people who actually just really either were quite angry or arrogant at us and slammed the door. But really, I mean, we visited over 10,000 households the first couple of years, and that was truly amazing to know that most people were open to receive us because we were not proselytizing. We had a message of, of inviting them and a message of concern, really, uh, and a message on behalf of our pastor at that time. Well, you know, there is one home, and the story I want to share with you on as, as related to our the story here with uh, the compassion of our Lord, and, and this one story that I'll never, ever forget, and there's others, but this one, where it was late in the day, and it was in the fall, it was quite cool, and I'm getting a little tired, <laughs> and I'm being really, you know, honest with my, I'm telling my husband, I'm really tired, and we only have an hour to go, can we quit a bit early, and we'll make it up later, and so on, and he said, no, let's just, we've got to finish this, the street. Well, would you know that the very last house on that street, and it was actually not the end of the day, it was in the afternoon, I wanted to take a break, let me, let me go back with that story, because it's really, yeah, there, this story is, it's, we, I wanted to take my break earlier, and it was an hour than earlier than usual, and so um, he, so Deacon Tom says, my husband says, no, let's finish, let's finish with the street, let's visit all the homes, and then we'll take our break. Well, at the very last house uh, we visited, it was in the af- mid afternoon, early afternoon, and um, a man answers the door, and he uh, appears intoxicated. And so we introduced ourselves, though, as being from St. Matthew Catholic Church, asked if he was Catholic, and and he said, uh, no, I'm not Catholic, but I want you to come in and have a drink with me. Well, we can tell by looking at the man that he was bothered. I mean, he was intoxicated, but it was something was bothering him. So we accepted his invitation, We walked, not to drink, but we accepted his invitation to walk into the house. We sat uh, on the sofa, and he sat across from us, And he began to tell us what was going on in his heart. He said, Today is one year since my wife has died. It's her one year anniversary. 
and he points to a beautiful portrait on a wall of her. She was quite beautiful. And he says to us, I miss her so deeply. I took off work. I took off. Uh, I'm home from work today because I couldn't handle being at work knowing that I would be remembering my wife. And that's why I'm drunk. Well, he began to weep. He wept. And I, well, I wept too with him because it hurt. It touched my heart. I really felt his anger, his pain. I, I can empathize. I mean, I was, I think, well, I know how it is to lose a loved one and, and, you know, I can't imagine losing your spouse. And so after he finished weeping, he looked at us and he sort of like just calmed down. And my husband, Tom, asked, what would you like for us to pray with you? He said, yes, please. And we prayed. But after we prayed, he said to us, I want to share something with you. This morning when I woke up, I said, God, help me. I'm not going to make it this day. I need you. Well, I mean, imagine that. When he said that, my heart jumped, not only with joy, but in a way because I knew God heard it. I mean, he was like, he was... God was confirming his prayer. And so we, we told him that. We said, um, we, we, we called him by name. We said, sir, I said, you know, the Lord heard your prayer. He, he read your heart. He loves you so much. And I, his countenance changed. I mean, he became more at peace and calm. And, but it's a lesson for us. You know, I'm not pointing to Tom and I as being the ones that, we're the heroes here. No, we're just instruments of our Lord. We're just his servants. But God used us as he wants to use you in situations that may be similar. Because nothing is coincidental with God. If truly we live in his presence and we are aware of him in our lives, then things are providential. It's providence, like in the situation with this man. This man, I mean, I would not have met him if I quit early and took my break, my break early. But it was the persistence of my husband that we finished that, that street that we met this gentleman. And to this day, I'll, I'll remember that story because it taught me a lot. That we can, we can never take for granted God's compassion. And that God hears, hears this man lying in his bed that morning, crying out to God all alone and feeling pain anguish and sorrow of losing his wife, missing his wife, and yet here God provided us to go and knock on his door. So, you know, I, I really, I think that, again, this is a great lesson for us in the sense that we are um, not only his servants, that God wants to, if I say use us, yes, because he loves us, and and we're, and we're called to be little lights in, in this world that needs so much hope as John Paul II would call the civilization of, of death. It's a civilization of darkness in the sense that people are walking about uh, with, depending on what social media or the media is telling them to live, how they should live, instead of um, the, the, the Word, the Word made flesh, the eternal Word, uh, which is Christ himself, God. Um. So I, I just I just wanted to let I wanted to share that story with you because it, it, I think it relates very much to this journey uh, in the heart of Jesus and his heart and the compassion of our Lord. You know, Jesus has the power not only to multiply the fish and loaves and feed thousands, as we heard earlier. Yes, not only to raise Lazarus from the dead for the glory of the Father, he also forgives sins. He has come to heal the whole person, the whole. Now, soul and body, spirit and mind. He is the divine physician. I love to, that title. That I, I use that title quite often when I pray with my friends or others who are sick. That the Lord, the divine physician, is the one that is caring. That is is caring for us. He's the one that can heal us. Accord, you know. He can heal us with the medical doctors, right? In the case of, of being physically sick uh, or, or using other means in, in uh, you know, Bible study or being in a community or a message, like I said, you know, things when we are in light of God's, um, if, 
if we're in, in in his light and and really living wanting to live in his grace then we can see more so the opportunities that occur before us and see that they are providential not coincidental the compassion of our lord to all, toward all who suffer goes so far that he identifies himself with them he says i was i was sick and you visited me his, perf- his his love for the sick has not ceased through the centuries to draw the very special attention of Christians toward all those who suffer in body and soul. It is a source of tireless efforts to comfort them. And Jesus wept for the loss of his friend Lazarus. The fruit of his presence, the miracles he performed, were for the glory of God, his heavenly Father, so we can believe in the omnipotent power and mercy of God, who is the creator of the universe. This is the understanding that we need to take with us. We can offer him our small loaves, our prayers, being confident that he will do with these accordingly to the Father's will. And for our own good, whatever our past or our present may be, God can truly make wonders in us, can transform us anew, can make miracles in us so long as we are open and receptive to him. The compassion of Jesus, our master, is real, and it is endless. And I mentioned earlier on our journey that um, we were going to include a story of a role model, a saint, who because of an accident he experienced, caused him to discover the gifts he had to offer God, which resulted in telling others about the mercy and compassion of the Lord. So who is the saint? Who is this role model? Well, there's St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius of Loyola was a priest, preacher, and founder of the Jesuit community. He was in 1491 in a castle in Loyola, northern Spain. That's where he was born, actually, in, in, in this castle in Loyola, northern Spain. His family, his family name was Lopez, and his parents were landowners. He was the youngest of 13 children. He lived in this castle and became um, a page uh, in the court, at the court there. The courtly lifestyle was filled with temptation, and Ignatius was knee-deep in it all. He became addicted to gambling, became a playboy, and developed a highly contentious personality. The Christian faith was far from his interest. Well, he experienced the compassion of the Lord in the way most unexpected. At the age of 30, he went into battle against the French over, over a territorial dispute. A cannonball struck him, breaking one leg and wounding the other. The French soldiers, admiring his bravery, did not carry him to prison, but rather to his home, the castle in Loyola. The leg was set, but didn't heal. The doctors broke ooh, and reset it again without anesthesia. Can you imagine that? I mean, I just every time I think about that story, and I've read it many times, I, I still shrug because I, you know, because of the fact that what he had to go through. Well, he grew worse, and it was, and he was told he should prepare for death. Well, he remained at home, confined to his bed. As time went on, his leg did heal, but the bone protruded below the knee, and he had one leg shorter than the other, so he walked with a, with a limp. Eventually, when he did walk, it was with a limp. To him, this was unacceptable. He demanded the doctors saw off the protruding bone, which is the bone piece, and lengthened the short leg by systematically stretching it. Imagine his determination. His vanity was not rewarded, and all his life he walked with a limp. Well, during his long recuperation, he asked his sister for reading material, specifically on the topic of chivalry and romance. Instead, his sister, who is a devout Catholic, brought him two books on the life of Christ and the other was about the saints. Well, since he couldn't get up and exchange the books, he went ahead and began to read the books. He found himself curiously satisfied and at peace when reflecting on the life of Christ and on the saints. Well, his conversion had begun. After regaining health, he decided to journey on pilgrimage to Montserrat, which is um, a shrine of Our Lady of Montserrat. It's a beautiful shrine. I've seen it. It's in near Barcelona, Spain, which is a home to a miraculous image of Mary, the mother of God. 
It is, and she's under the title of Our Lady of Montserrat. And the shrine is built on top of this mountain um, to house the image and, and uh, has a monastery with monks. Well, he was drawn to fall on his knees and ask his forgiveness once he, once he you know, reached the shrine. He knelt in prayer all night before this image of Mary. And in the morning, he renounced his former life, left his sword and knife at the altar as a sign of leaving his past life, and gave his clothes to the poor, <laughs> to a poor beggar that was nearby, actually. He dressed himself in a rough garment, sandals, and a staff. He walked down that mountain to a cave to, in a nearby town and intended to stay a few days. Well, he stayed 10 months. He spent time in prayer, fasting, and learned that the Lord's forgiveness and compassion is free. This experience arrived, served at, as the foundation for his famous spiritual exercises, which have guided countless individuals uh, and retreats. At the age of 33, he studied for the priesthood and later ordained. He was ordained um, around that time. He studied for 11 years in various Euro European universities with great difficulty, beginning almost as a child. But at the age of 43, he and six others, six other men specifically, vowed to live in poverty and chastity and to teach about the compassion of Christ. This was the beginning of the Jesuit community. Their motto was, for the greater glory of God. Isn't that a great motto? For the greater glory of God. That could be, that could be our motto, right? Every day, for the greater glory of God. Well, Ignatius was a true mystic. He centered his spiritual life on the essential foundations of Christianity. All activity was to be guided by a true love of, of the church and unconditional obedience to the Holy Father, for which reason all professed members took a fourth vow to go wherever the Pope should send them for the salvation of souls. Ignatius died at the age of 65. The church celebrates his feast day on July 31st. He is the patron saint of soldiers, retreats, and spiritual exercises. So if you'd like to read more about St. Ignatius of Loyola, we, you can obtain our pamphlet on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. And this pamphlet is a, uh, it's a, it's a short pamphlet that we've compiled uh, about a story. And we have many of those on various saints because of our ministry here at Pilgrim Center of Hope called Socials with the Saints that um, introduce people on a monthly basis. Once a month, we have a event here at Pilgrim Center of Hope where we read uh, those who gather, read the pamphlet together, and then we have a spiritual discussion. Um, how we can relate to the saint or how the saint can, um, you know, teach us uh, today, no matter what century they lived. Because remember, the saints are the living members, they're living members of the body of Christ. We're called to be saints, but they've made it with a capital S uh, in, in the sense that the church has recognized them because of their heroic virtues, their heroic way of living the Christian life, and really just living the the two greatest commandments, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so these socials with the saints on a monthly basis are at Pilgrim Center of Hope. And it's it's pretty, um, and if you can't come in person, we have, the, the pamphlet is actually read into a podcast. And so you could also listen to that um, uh, on our, our website or on your favorite podcast. It's under socials with the saints. You know, again, the saints teach us so much about the compassion of Jesus. Don't you know that they all experienced this compassion? That's why after they went through a conversion. I mean, think about your own conversion. Think of, or think about the times when you experienced a good of God from God. Whether it be a good message, good news from a doctor, or just feeling good and knowing that all of a sudden you catch yourself thanking God and and we need to be aware of that. That's that comes from the heart. That comes from the heart. And when we're tempted to be angry, and anger is is, is a just emotion, and and it causes us to move forward with courage to address situations that need to be addressed, but not to stay in anger. To stay in anger is different, and it can lead to other consequences. 
But if we do come across a situation where we can become angry, then think of the compassion of our Lord. And sometimes I think, well, Jesus, how would you respond to this? How should I respond? And and it would the more we we we, we try to do this on a daily basis, the more we choose in our mind these thoughts or in our words to say these, this prayer, whether it be to ourselves or even out loud, if we're with a friend or a family member, we're witnessing to them, but we're also out loud reminding ourselves of what we believe in. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm driving in the car and I may be alone if I'm driving and I'm, you know, sorry to praise God or I'm imploring His mercy because all of a sudden I feel like, well, God, I'm just so thankful, but I want to pray now for it at times when maybe I'm remembering my friends or someone who called me recently and said they need a prayer. I remember them and I want to pray for them. So this is how we can act as a compassionate disciple of our Lord. So again, the foundation that we stand on is very strong, friends, very strong. And, um, and you think, well, I don't want to fall through the cracks. Are there any cracks? No, there aren't any cracks. If we do fall, it's uh, we're not going to work. We'll we'll get it right back up. And and Jesus says, come to me. Come to me in confession. Come to me, all who are labor, who are burdened in labor, and for I will give you rest. He can give us rest in confession. Um, every confession is like a little deliverance, help it, delivering us from from. But we'll, from what we need to be delivered from in order to experience the mercy of God and begin anew. Well, uh, so I'd like to uh, ask you to um, to think about that. And again, go to our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org, to obtain the pamphlet on St. Ignatius of Loyola. He's a good role model, um, one to, to read and to be inspired by. Join me as we close with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, take all of my freedom, my memory, my understanding, my will, and all that I have and cherish you have given me. It's surrender it all to you so that I and others will be guided by your holy will. Your grace and your love and wealth are enough for each one of us. Give us these things, Lord Jesus, we ask for nothing more. Amen. And the jewel for the journey uh, is from, it's a spiritual gem we'd like to give you, and I almost forgot to give you right before the prayer, this beautiful journey, uh, this beautiful spiritual gem for the journey is from St. Mother Teresa. She says, I would rather make mistakes in kindness and compassion than work miracles in unkindness and hardness. And so, you know, that's a beautiful quote. I'm going to repeat it again. I would rather make mistakes in kindness and compassion than work miracles in unkindness and hardness. You know, this journey, the scriptural journey on the compassion of Jesus has inspired me, and I hope it has inspired you. I want to hear from you. You know, go to our website. Let us know uh, how it has touched your heart, um, let us give praise to God and give testimony to Him. Share this with others so that um, when they hear this, this story and they hear the Scripture story come alive for them, and it, it, they will be given hope, given hope that God, even in, among the multitudes that were on along the shore of Galilee that Jesus fed, he knew each soul. He knew them. And many were there out of curiosity, perhaps. Many were there because their friends were going and it was on their way to their destination. Or perhaps they were there sincerely to know more about Jesus and to hear his message. But we find ourselves on that same journey. We find ourselves, well, Maybe we're just curious at this point, or we're too busy to pray, or, Lord, I'm just on my busy, my way to to work, and or or my way to a project, and I just need to concentrate on that alone. But even on your way, walk whether it be walking to your tool shed or 
or driving to work or or driving to pick up something to eat, <laughs> stop and think of a of a short prayer. Stop and think about the compassion of our Lord and know that He knows you. And as Mother Teresa says, to just um to 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 make that act of kindness and that act of charity towards our Lord, to look up to heaven and raise your eyes for a second and thank the Lord. Thank the Heavenly Father and thank the Lord Jesus and thank the Holy Spirit for the grace that you have at that moment and then ask to continue to receive the graces needed for the rest of the day, the rest of the evening, the rest of the week. Thank you for joining us. And again, pilgrimcenterofhope.org, we invite you to visit us.